Hi, I'm John Harris. I'm a composer. I uh, do a lot of work for theatre and for um, opera, and I write music for films as well, um, and a bit of concert music. And I've also been working as a composer in uh, East Lothian, working at Knox Academy and also at North Berwick High School. And right now I'm working with Ken Johnson at Knox Academy on a new composing resource that's going to go online in September for uh, kids who are doing hires music and to really help you with your composing for hires. It's uh, aimed at people who get a bit stuck, um, and we all get a bit stuck to be honest when writing music, um, but it's aimed to help you when you've got specific questions as to what you should do at any point. And I'm going to talk about that today. So. Uh, you should be able to find it by the time you see this video. Uh, it's going to go up on Edibuzz, and um, as I say, it should be from September. So we're there to ask specific questions, and I think the way that Ken and I have been thinking about it is the best place to start is with a chord sequence. Now, uh, you can start with a melody. A lot of people like to. If you do start with a melody, then you can get a bit stuck when you have to put chords underneath it. So why you recommend with a chord is because if you understand what the chords are that are underneath your piece, then everything else flows from that. It, the, chords are, the way the chords work is like the grammar. It's like writing a sentence or writing a paragraph or writing a whole story. It's really the harmonies, the chords underneath, that run it. So what we recommend is starting with a really simple thing, just triads, three note chords, and get a chord sequence that you like. Experiment with it, get a keyboard or write it on Sibelius or use a guitar or whatever it is that you happen to do and, and knock out a chord sequence that you're happy with just do them in root position. And it might sound a little bit ugly at first. You might kind of go, oh, I don't want to write a piece that sounds like this. But you just get something that you like, even if you're kind of not that committed to it, but you quite like it. It's a really, really good starting place. Write it down, um, or get your teacher to help you write it down if you're stuck. Um, and then, to some extent, put that to one side. Then think about how you're going to write a melody that goes over the top of it. When you write the melody, again, start with the notes that are in the chords. So. Uh, if you find a note in the chord that you like, try that against the next one. You can add notes and change notes as you go along. But to get the basic structure, if you write a melody that has nothing to do with the chords that are underneath, then you get this really weird effect. Now, some composers really like that, okay? But it's really hard to work with, um, and you'll find yourself getting stuck all the time. Whereas if you use start with using notes that are in the chords, it's much, much, much more straightforward. Then, if you have started with a melody, Instead, if you, if you decide to ignore my advice entirely and decide with a melody, say you like playing the flute and you've got this great idea for a melody, or you like want to write a song and you've got this great idea for a song and you've got the melody, writing the chords underneath it is quite difficult. And we have we have written a guide to help you do that. It's against doing the reverse thing, working out what the notes are in your melody and trying to work out which chords fit best underneath it. You really, really need to use your ears and your brain to work that out. But hopefully, by the time you see this, um, that will be up online and it should offer you some kind of help in working out what the chords are underneath. So you've got chords, you've got kind of basic chords, you can't kind of a basic melody. What do you want to do next? So with your melody, and you want to make it a little bit more interesting. Okay, you may think, oh, you know, this melody is just a little bit clunky. Um, that you want to add notes that aren't in the chords. So you want to think about things that, that that maybe fit between the notes, or maybe even notes that you play at the same time, the, the, the melody that you play at the same time, that doesn't actually fit in the chord. It's quite an important principle, which is that if you really do choose notes that aren't to go with the chords, then you need to find a way of resolving. Now, resolving is like a technical musical term that you probably understand. It means basically if you've got something, there'll be a tension between your chord and the note in your melody if the note in the melody it doesn't sit inside the chord. So you need to find a way of resolving it, making it better, in inverted commas, um, dropping down or going up to the next note that's in the chord. But you can put in these extra notes in your melody, they're called passing notes. And you can get them to basically, they will help your, your melody sound freer, sound more, sound more melodic, really. Um, and you don't even necessarily, at this point, need to be thinking about what instrument is going to be played on. That's kind of coming next. You may have some idea, you might think, this sounds great on a flute, or this sounds great on a guitar, or maybe it'd be really nice to sing this, or it sounds great on an oboe, or a trumpet, or whatever it happens to be. And that could be running at the back of your mind. Um, there's lots of other tricks for helping you make your melody uh, better. If you're feeling really adventurous, you can use notes that aren't even in the key that your, your chords are sitting in. You can add in what are called chromatic notes. Um, these are worth experimenting with. Just try them out. 
composing, I will say this, is a kind of is like a game. So you're endlessly playing with it. And you may find that uh, something works, something doesn't work. You don't have to commit to anything. The brilliant thing about, about writing on computer or on Sibelius is that if you don't like something, you could try it out for a bit, see how it sits, take it away again. Just like writing like an essay on a word processor or, um, or writing a story on a computer. You don't have to rub everything out. You can just basically take it away, try it again, have lots of different versions. It's really, really important you keep playing. The chord sequence isn't even set in stone as well. You can change that too if you find yourself thinking, mm, I'm not so sure about that. I think I might do this instead. So you have a melody that you're beginning to get happy with. You have chords that you're thinking, mm, they're all right, they're fine. Um, what might be great with the chords is to make them a little bit more interesting. Now, you'll probably, you'll find as you play these chords, like three notes here, three notes there, three notes there, and jumps about all over the place like this. And you're going, oh, crikey, this actually really sounds sort of quite... Quite primitive is probably the word you think about. Uh, 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 uh. Well, the thing to do is as soon as you start to get into, uh, when you know what the notes of your chords are, it's quite straightforward to do what's called inverting the chord. All that means is, say for instance you've got like a chord of C major, C, E, and G. Rather than putting the C in the bass, the bottom note, you've got the E, and it goes E, G, C for the first inversion. Or if you've got, um, you decide to put G in the bass, that's that's G, C, E. And with your chord sequence, if you just you can just make it a little bit smoother by when you move from one chord to the next, you might find that if you just keep the top note as close to the top note of the next chord as possible, and you just play the inversion that suits that. It might take you a little bit of working out. So you sit down with a piece of paper and work it out and think, I'll try this. Okay, it may not happen instantly, you might go, oh I could just do it like this. It might just require you to just use a little bit of brain. So there's that, it's one thing to do. That can be incredibly powerful. Um, I know a lot of great pieces that are just written literally with two chords. <laughs> And because they managed to do it by changing the inversion, it makes it all sound like a whole new chord. There you go. Um, it could be a fantastically powerful tool. The other thing you do is add notes. So you've probably discovered that if you add the seventh, yeah, if you come across a thing called the dominant seventh, well, if you add that, that can make a chord feel quite different. Dominant seventh is quite a powerful thing as well, so you know, that's something else. Um, you might want to add a sixth, which makes it sound sometimes makes it a bit more jazzy. So six is like the six notes above the root of the chord. Um, doesn't normally sit inside the chord. Um, what else might you want to add to chords? Uh, there's all kinds of other special chords. Guitarists will know all about suspended chords. Um, you might do quite radical things to your harmony. Now this is completely changed to the chord. You might want to use an augmented chord instead of something else. You might want to use a diminished chord. These are kind of real things that guitarists would be quite used to. Um, pianists might not be quite so used to. People used to writing on the piano. Um, and people who play just melodic instruments might not. But they could be very powerful, but it doesn't mean completely changing your harmony. So you just rip one chord out and stick another chord in instead. That's kind of fine. You can do that. You can try them. Um, again, this is all going to be on the website. So things that will show you how it is um, and uh, what the effect is of changing that kind of a chord. Uh, but at that point, they start to play with the chords and change them and getting just them a little bit more colourful, getting your chord sequence a little bit smoother. And then comes the great moment uh, after you've got your melody and you've got your chords, you're kind of happy with your melody, you're kind of happy with the chords, then deciding at that point, okay, right now I'm going to start thinking about what instrument. And this is the moment at which the whole thing becomes, can become a completely different flower into something completely wonderful. So melody, you have to decide what you're going to play the melody on, or whether it's going to be sung, all those kind of things. Then you've got your accompaniment. And you've got your bass. Those are the three things. You can add in rhythm parts as well, of course. You can have drum kits or you can have other things playing along too. This is the moment at which you start to think about adding those things. Um, you uh, Obviously, people might want, say, with the, the, uh, the kind of central chord part, might want to be a piano, might be want to be a guitar. Uh, what else might, might want to play on the organ? Might want to play on the glockenspiel. I don't know. Anything that can play more than one note at once. Um, those things, it's really worth thinking about how the, when you've got the chord, what how you might play that chord. So it's quite simple to go bat, 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 just the repetition of the chord. But maybe it's much more interesting to find an interesting rhythm that you can play, spread the chord out, so that it's not just all the notes being played at one time. So you can have this kind of baka chicka 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 baka chicka 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 or whatever it is you happen to want having going on. So but you split the thing across um you split the chord up, you can turn it into what's called different figuration, which means you use different pattern. Um, and guitarists, of course, be really used to that, playing chords in different sorts of ways. It's a sort of straightforward chords or picking chords or whatever it is. 
We have lots of ideas on the website for rhythms that you might want to use for the accompaniment, which you could also adapt for use in the melody as well. At this point, the piece really starts to come alive. So you've done the hard graft of getting your kind of chord sequence sorted out so it's pretty rock solid. You've got the melody sorted out so it's pretty rock solid. You then find that you uh, need to add a bass. Now the bass uh, should really follow what's called the root note of the chords that you've got. This is where the understanding of how your chords in your piece um, function. It's incredibly important. So it should really follow quite, cl quite closely. So you've got a C major chord, so C, E, G, like this. It should really follow the C. It can play the other notes as well, but it's really important you've got that because that's the solid foundation of your harmony. So kind of maybe on the first beat of the bar, you put down the root note there in the bass. Whatever's playing the bass. It could be electric bass, it could be a stand-up bass, it could be somebody who's singing the bass. It could be a cello, it could be trombone, don't, tuba, whatever it is that you fancy in your ensemble, that's kind of fine. Um, but make sure that it's in there. The, uh, and then so you've got the root notes wherever the chords change as well. So now you've got a kind of bass, you've got an accompaniment, you've got a melody. Um, you maybe even have added a drum part. Um, and you're stuck, because that happens to us all. You get to a point you're composing and think, I have no idea what I'm going to do next. Okay. Now this is probably the only piece of real composing advice by hard earned over the years getting stuck myself. Composing is all about either doing something the same or doing it different. <laughs> I know that sounds like, oh yeah, duh, but it's true. You may find that just repeating a whole section is actually what your piece needs. So if you're the listener, you need to hear something twice. Go, that was really nice. If you then play it once, the listener might need to or want to hear it again. Now there's a very, very simple trick you can do. If you, if you play it once and then repeat it, if you slightly change the end, so maybe you land a different chord at the very end, or maybe you change the melody so it goes in a different direction, or maybe the complement moves a little bit, or maybe the bass goes in a different direction, that can often lead you into a new idea, what we might call a contrasting section. So one of the things that you, one of these sort of simple things is people kind of go, I'm stuck, but they go, well, you've only played the melody once. Play the melody again, okay? And then change it towards the end, and that often leads you off. You'll find a lot of songs, a lot of pieces do that. That's because the composer knows that you often need to hear something twice to start off with. Then you've got a contrasting idea, and what you've done at the end of the first melody may give you what you what you should do next. Now on the site we'll have lots and lots and lots of hints and tips as to what you should do, or what you can try. There's lots of different things, taking little bits of the melody and then just kind of expanding them, repeating them into different sequences. There's lots of um, uh, ways in which you might want to change the chords that sit underneath. When you do your repeat, if you think it's a little bit boring, you can maybe just in, you can maybe just add or take away something. You can do things like add what we call a counter melody, which is merely just a second melody that runs alongside the other ones. So if you're an audience member, you hear it once, you hear it again, but something different is happening, but it's kind of the same. That's a good thing to do. Moving into contrasting section, you can do all kinds of things. You could even, if it was really contrasting, different time signature, different key signature. Whew. So you actually transpose into a different thing, into a completely different key. Say you start in C major, you might decide to go into what's called the relative minor, which is A minor. So you have a section that's in the minor key. And on the website again, we'll tell you how to do that. It doesn't sound really clunky. Okay, there's specific composing things that are really valuable when you do that. Um, and then, when you, then you, once you've got that and you've got your contrasting section, you've nearly got your whole piece, really. Um, Hires, I think the maximum you have to, or that side, it's one and a half minutes. So you've got sort of, you've got an opening section, you've got a contrasting section. What do you want to do next? You might go into another contrasting section. The classic thing to do is to then, once you've finished your middle thing, to go back to the beginning and restate what's called restate and recapitulation is the, is the technical term. Basically, restate the original idea. You might want to do it differently in some way. Might want to change the chords. Might want to change the instruments played on. Might want to change the melody. Might want to stick it up the octave. Might want to stick it down the octave. There's all kinds of things that you can do. That are really simple tricks. Don't have to make big changes, but actually to the listener, making them making sort of some kind of change means that you don't hear the thing exactly the same. You've got your opening. You've got your contrasting section. You've got your thing. You just need a big finish. There's your piece. One thing I would say, when you've got your piece, remember, make sure your piece has a title. Make sure that it has a tempo marking at the beginning 
Okay, how fast is your piece? So when you sit down, you kind of go, is it fast, is it slow? How many beats is that per minute? It's got it. Make sure that you've remembered to put in things like dynamics. How loud is it? Does it get louder? Does it get quieter? Do you want it all plays staccato? Dick, 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 or do you want it all play legato? If you've got phrase markings, where do the phrases begin in? Where should you breathe if you're a singer? Where should you breathe if you're a flautist? Those kind of things. And they really, really bring your piece to life. Okay? But the most important thing is time signature, tempo marking, title, <laughs> key signature as well. Don't forget that too. Um, and also, but just make sure that it looks like a real piece of music. Again, on the site, there's going to be a lot of little markers that kind of go, hmm, I think you should try this. I think you should do this. This is what's going to make your piece finally come alive. Um, so, do come and have a look. It's going to be on EdgyBuzz from September. And it's a piece, and it's really designed for when you get stuck. And you don't have to be at the beginning. You don't have to go um, with this uh, website. You don't have to go on, I have to follow it all the way through. If you get stuck halfway through your piece, come and have a look at the site. It should be able to help you. Good luck. I'm really looking forward to hearing your pieces. Thank you.